Hi everyone and welcome to my final episode of Sound Advice Entrepreneurs Unfiltered. The brilliant journalist, editor, author and original Sound Advice podcast host Rebecca Byrne Callender is back from maternity leave so I am handing my podcast mic back to her. But before I sign off, we're teaming up to bring you another freelancer special. Get ready to hear tips, tricks and cringeworthy anecdotes about the thing all freelancers dread. Awkward conversations with clients. Welcome back, Bex. Oh, thank you, Kate. And thank you so much for doing such an amazing job with the podcast. I've been listening to you. I've been pushing my buggy around Fruition Park (laughs) with you in my headphones. Just really enjoying all the amazing guests you've had. So yeah, it's been a blast hearing these episodes while I've been off. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for trusting me with this brilliant project. Um, So you've been off for six months now, Bex, um, just getting back into the swing of things after maternity leave. What's been the toughest thing about coming back to work? It is tricky coming back because I think you... So much of your identity is tied up with, well, for me anyway, with my career, my work. And then you put all of that on hold for however long. And then you've got to try and like scrabble it back somehow. I've been lucky that I've been able to come back gradually. So um, my daughter, Marina, started off doing a couple of days in nursery and then rising to three days. So I started taking on projects slowly and building back my confidence. Um, But it is hard. I mean, you you don't want to deluge yourself with loads of projects because you don't want to let anyone down you definitely don't want anyone thinking oh she's come back but she's lost her edge or she's not really got her mind in the game at the moment so you want to make sure that all the work you do when you come back from mat leave is still you know exceptional but at the same time I'm I'm breastfeeding my daughter so when she's in nursery I have to do pumping and interrupt my flow if I'm writing a feature or recording a podcast and go off and get the dreaded machine out (laughs) that's an awkward conversation in itself isn't it have you been like midway through a meeting and said excuse me I've got to go and pump I have oh I'm I'm just zero filter I don't know whether it's kind of post-pregnancy hormones but I'll be like really sorry my tits hurt gotta go and then that'll be the end of the end of the online (laughs) meeting people have been really nice about it though and have you found it hard to pick up work again um, since you've been back? Or have you got the opposite problem where you're being inundated with emails and work? I think this is the interesting thing about um, having kids later in life. So I'm going to be 40. And so I've had all this time to establish my career. Some of the clients that I've had have been with me for years. So it was quite easy when I stepped away to tell them I'll be back on this date. And certain certain um And some of these clients were just ready to step back in as soon as I was back at my laptop. And that's been great. And um, and I just had two or three that were primed, ready to go. Um, But I haven't been brave enough to do the full mail out yet and let the whole portfolio of clients know that I'm back because I'm just terrified of there suddenly being way too much work and then me having to have the awkward conversation and be like, oh, I'm really sorry. I told everyone it was available, but actually I've already said yes to this, this and this, and I can't do anything for you now. So I'm um, I'm just waiting to do that, basically. Yeah. Well, the secret is out now. The minute this podcast episode comes out, you're going to be have a deluge of emails and work. I'll be like, what? You didn't tell us, rude. <laughs> So um, I did want to bring up that point, actually, around saying no to work. What's the best way to do it? How do you do it without burning any professional bridges? If you want me to bring the realness, I will say often lie. (laughs) I beg if you do not want to do a project, the best way to let someone down is just to say, I'm really sorry, this sounds fabulous. I'd be really keen to do it, but I'm just too busy. And I think sometimes that is just the way to manage everyone's emotions yours and the clients um I know that you're not supposed to lie I know we're all supposed to bring our full selves to work and and be brutally honest but I find that sometimes that's just the best way to avoid having an awkward conversation in in the first place um are you more honest than me do you do you tell people exactly why you're turning them down no um so if it's something I really don't want to do and I know I don't want to do it because of that feeling in my stomach so I've just definitely learned to trust that a bit more if I just think oh not keen I will turn it down even if it's lucrative um I will normally yeah I will go with that I'm too busy 
or I will say, I don't think I'm the best fit for this. So I will be honest and I will try and then put them in touch with an, another freelancer who would be better and is available. Um, I think if you can present them with another solution, that kind of keeps you in their good books. Um, if it is a case of I'm just too booked up and busy, I will try and tell them when I'm available. So I might say I'm really booked up at the moment, but available from September. So please let me know if anything else comes up. Um, just because I don't want them to not think about me the next time a project comes up. That's so funny that that sinking feeling that you described, because I know it. I know it inside out. Just when you read the brief and literally like the, your stomach just drops away and you think this is just going to be a nightmare. <laughs> and if you don't listen to that feeling, and I've done that just before I went on to mat leave, um, a big regular client came to me and said, we've got this white paper um, and Oxford University have put it together and it's about this really gnarly issue in financial services. We want you to write the executive summary. And um, and I, I looked at it and I was like, I don't really know that much about this particular like quirk of financial services. I had that sinking feeling and I just, something was telling me, don't do it, don't do it. But I was like, it's good money. So I said, oh, let me have a look. And then they sent me the report and it was just illegible. I didn't understand <laughs> how they come up with these like numbers that like the, the data matrix was just a complete spaghetti junction and I had to pull out at that point be like I've read the report I think the report's really awful and there's no way that I can make an executive summary out of it you'll have to give it to someone else I didn't I didn't say it as brutally as that but that was my punishment for not just listening to my gut but it was good that you hadn't actually agreed you just said send me a copy of the report so I can have a look and work out whether I'm the right fit for this so I think that was a really good move that you didn't agree to it until you had got the full brief and knew what you were getting yourself into yeah never completely commit until you're confident you can do the work and do it to the best of your ability um, otherwise yes awkward conversations will follow <laughs> so what happens where you have committed you've signed the dot line you're halfway through a project and then the client asks you to do something as part of that project that you're not comfortable with what do you do? Yeah, I was thinking about this um, because there's been a few instances where I've suddenly been like, I don't really enjoy this anymore. And I've realized that it happens either because, I'll be frank, of my own ego, or it'll happen because um, there's something ethically or ethically dubious about what I've been asked to do. And what I've learned is that when it's due with ego, I mean, I'll give you an example. One of my um, tech clients I do some ghostwriting for I used to write all these really great entrepreneur posts for him like tips and tricks on how to grow your business faster and I love that stuff and I loved that it went out into the world and got loads of likes and loads of comments and you know you kind of bask no one knew it was me writing it but you bask in the reflected glow of this post doing well and then he got a new marketing director and the marketing director was like this is unnecessary expense um you need to be putting loads of um detail about the platform about the features about you know customer testimonials into this what was an entrepreneur blog and I started to have to write what was basically marketing puff and I hated it and I felt like it had gone so far from the original brief and I wanted to quit because I was like I'm not a marketing person and when I was reading back what I'd written I didn't feel any pride in my work and I had to just have a word with myself and be like don't get too big for your boots you know this is a great client he's asked you to do this job do the job to the best of your ability. At least you can try and make it a bit more entrepreneur focused because that's what you care about. And lo and behold, after a month or so, that marketing director got the sack and then we went back to writing the original post. And if I had pulled out, then I would have lost a really great client and soured a relationship and then ultimately lost that revenue stream. Um, so that was the right way to go. But then on the other side, I had a client who wanted me to change quotes, like wanted me to change direct quotes so that they were more favorable about their product. And at that point, I was like, that's that's not my ego. That is that is kind of an ethical issue. Um, and then I had to pull out and I had to say no. Um, and I think it's important to know, is it ethics or is it ego and make the right call? What about you? I've had similar situations on both fronts, actually, where it's around ego and I don't feel proud of what I'm writing, um, but that's become the brief and I have to stick to it. Um, I will sometimes just say, look, I'm really happy to do this, um, but can we not include my name against the piece? Yeah. And 
people are normally happy with that. It's so I would consider it more like copywriting. Yeah. Um, in other situations, I've been asked to interview people, and when I've researched them, I've realised that they have a really bad reputation in the industry, or there's been some poor reviews about the company or there's been some legal action against them and I'm just not comfortable. And usually I will flag that immediately with the client and say, mm. I don't think it's good for me to interview them and I don't think it's going to be a good look for you. And normally clients will immediately pull that interview because they don't want to be tarnished with that. So I think, again, it's just about being really honest. The minute there's a red flag, um, you should raise it yeah, and not be afraid to do so. I think it's also awkward where a lot of this is in emails and sometimes the tone of your email or the tone of a client's email can be very different to the way that you would speak to somebody. So I would always advise trying to put things in writing, but also jumping on um, a Zoom call with someone. It's so easy now. We've got Zoom and Teams and Google Meet and everything. It's so much easier to do that. Um, whereas before, you know, you'd want to try and meet a client for a coffee to have those face-to-face -face conversations. Um now I'd say put everything in writing in an email, but do try and have a face-to-face -face as well because the tone is going to be very different. It's amazing how you can diffuse an awkward conversation with a smile just by showing that you are being positive in your approach to the theme or the topic or the challenge and you're just presenting yourself as willing to negotiate. You know, you're just presenting your view, but you are, you're smiling, you, you, you know, there's no ruffled feathers, no bad feeling. It makes such a difference. Um, I think that's, I think it's a really good bit of advice. Yeah, I think the more of more conversations you have that feel slightly awkward, the better you are as a freelancer or as a leader. Actually, there's a really good quote from um, Tim Ferriss, who's the American entrepreneur and author. And he said, a person's success in life can be measured by the number of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. And I think that word willing is really important because you have to put yourself out there and think, I'm going to be honest. And actually, you could reframe uncomfortable and awkward as just honest. Um, and actually, I wanted to talk to you as well, because it's not just conversations with clients. It's also awkward conversations with your partner that you have to have, um, which is a slightly different angle. But I think as a freelancer, it's often you and your job that means you can't necessarily get that mortgage or you can't necessarily plan for the summer holiday because you don't know how much income is going to be coming in um how do you have those kind of awkward conversations or financial conversations um with your partner I think it would be so much harder if my husband was also a freelancer but because he works sort of not exactly nine to five but you know he's got his working week his set hours it means that I can have some flexibility because we're not at war for, you know, that time when he's off, booked off, but actually, oh, look, there's got to be a last minute call. It doesn't work like that for him. Um, and I think um, because I met my husband when I was already freelancing, he's never known a different version of me. He's never known a version of me that isn't semi switched on, checking my emails, having to field last minute requests from clients. Um, and so I think it's never been a real issue. Um, when it came to our mortgage application, that's a funny one because it was tricky. Um, and uh, we had to, I think in the end, I had to work my socks off and have an amazing year um, as a sole trader, like literally had to double my revenue in a year and then do my accounts, get my lovely accountant to do my accounts like right after the year, the financial year had ended. So it was like, it was like at the end of January, he started doing it so that I could quickly get a new, an, an extra year's earnings onto my mortgage application. So I think in that case, I was able to present a solution. Um, so that was sort of all right. Um, I think I've just been really lucky though, because I was so established as a freelancer by that point that um, a lot of those awkward moments had passed. I think if you're just starting out, then you've got like three years of potentially some of those sticking points to deal with before you're like home free. Um, what about you? Because you've been traveling all it's... over the world recently and um, leaving your lovely husband, James, to hold the fort while you've been in Dubai and New York. Tell us about how, yeah. you, how you managed to swing that. <laughs> 
so that's a very sort of honest and frank conversation you have to have. So yeah, recently I've had some really amazing jobs in um, Saudi Arabia, India and America, which has, you know, taken me off and away from the family. But those kinds of ad hoc, lucrative projects and really exciting to be able to travel as well means that we have to have a conversation where, you know, we're prioritising my job in that instance. Um, and, you know, he then finds a way to work his job so that he can be there for all the pickups and look after the kids for four days or five days or however long I'm away for. Um, and I just think it actually does really help when you've got a super supportive partner, you know, no matter what role you're in, um, especially when you're, you know, you have a family thrown into the mix as well. But I do think it's hard. I do think it's hard working out, you know, who does what at home and at work. I think those are always awkward conversations. Yeah. I think that whether it's your client or your partner or freelancers that you might work with, I think the trick is always the give and the take. So to make sure that, you know, you look out for one another. And if someone gets a really amazing opportunity, you don't stand in their way. But similarly, you try and make yourself available for when they get the amazing opportunity. And you just have to try and make sure there's ebb and flow back and forth between you, um, which is just like the essence of making any sort of cooperation work. Yeah, 100%. Um and earlier you touched on negotiation. So I did want to ask you about the best way to negotiate a pay rise from your client. How do you deal with that? I wish I was better at it. And I think that it's something I would like to work on um, as as a freelancer. I'm, I'm pretty good at saying, look, um, my, my experience level is here. Um, the world has changed. I have proven myself in this in this way and that way and we have we we've seen this success as evidenced by metric a metric b therefore i would like a little bit more money um you have to be really evidence-based when you ask for more money you can't just be like oh you know i'd like an extra 50 quid or i'd like to put up my prices i think you have to say look this is what i've done for you um this is how successful you've been because of our partnership and i would like that reflected in uh, my remuneration um but it is hard to do that. I mean, some people say they put their prices up every year. I mean, that sounds amazing. I'd be making a fortune if I put them up every year. <laughs> but um, I do it like once every three years, which is not awful, but not great. Um, and it is, it's only an awkward conversation if you can feel that the client is either um, struggling financially or doesn't see the value, the true value in what you do. And I think... So that before you even start having a money conversation, I think it's just really important to choose the clients and the projects where you know that the client sees you as an amazing asset and sees the work that you do as being um, a credit to their organization or for their personal brand, because that is like the bedrock that makes that conversation possible. Um, how about you? What do you do when you want a little bit, a little bit more moolah? <laughs> um, well, I agree. I think, first of all, I do think clients are expecting it in this climate. I mean, I know a lot of, um, you know, service people that we use have put their prices up and I, I expect it and agree with it because, you know, we've got a cost of living crisis going on, um, inflation's, you know, uh, sky high. Um, but I don't think when you're telling clients you're putting your prices up, it's enough just to blame inflation I think you're right you have to talk about the whole experience that you're offering them and actually um we did an episode with James Ashford who's the founder of Go Proposal and he had a really good quote around um having those conversations around prices he said you can't just talk about price without talking about the whole experience people remember how you made them feel long after they've forgotten what you've done for them you have to have a method of presenting everything that you believe that person needs which I think is really interesting and it's what you were saying as well you have to talk about what else you're bringing other than just the work so you're bringing your experience you're bringing your contacts book I often find as part of a project I will link my client to other people or give them great entrepreneurs to interview and that's actually really invaluable um, to give them those connections um, so I think it's really presenting yourself in that way and showing them what they're going to be missing out on if they don't pay you that premium. 
yeah. I think it's also really important to talk to other freelancers who have worked with that client just to get a sense of, you know, are they good payers? Do they pay on time? What's the kind of going rate? Um, I do a lot of work for the Financial Times and I think they're really good in that they have set fees for whatever you're doing. So if you're working for FT Live on organising a half-day event, there are set fees in place. So whoever's working on that project will get paid exactly the same. And I often use those rates and show them to other clients and say, well, this is what the FT pays. So, you know, let's do it in line with that. And I think that's really helpful to have a kind of list of fees. Um, because actually, sometimes if you're taking out that process of negotiation, it's much easier on everybody. Yeah. And it, you're, you're completely right. When you're taking on a freelance project, you don't know if that project happened before, how much that freelancer got paid. And it's it, it's so helpful if you have a network and you can say, have you worked for a similar organization before? Have you done a similar kind of project or kind of scope of work? And, and what did you charge? Because otherwise it's awful. It's so awful when you realize that you've like charged half of what you could have done for a project and you find out like way down the line that so-and-so was like getting double um, and you just, it just, it just, it's a kick in the teeth because you just, it's your own fault. You've underpriced yourself. They said, what did you charge? You told them the number and it was wrong. So yeah, doing your research um, up front so that you make sure you get what's fair. Um, that's vital as well, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, and with awkward conversations, what about at the end of a project? So you've negotiated a great fee, you've done some what you thought was great work but then the clients come back and said they're not happy or they want to make a lot of changes to your copy or um for whatever reason you haven't lived up to their expectations how do you deal with negative feedback i've basically borrowed my approach from retail which is the customer is always right so um if someone's not happy with my work even if i think i've done it to the best of my ability I will apologize. I will say, I'll do whatever it takes to fix it. Just tell me how I can improve. You know, I really want you to be happy. And again, I know I talked about ego earlier, but sometimes you just have to swallow your pride and just put your hands up, especially if you have made a mistake. Absolutely, if you have made a mistake, say, this is entirely on me. I am really sorry that this mistake slipped through. I'm going to fix it now. And let me know if there's anything else I can do to try and mitigate the consequences of this mistake. Um, and actually, the way that you respond to someone telling you you've made a mistake, if you make it a positive interaction, you, you're humble, you're apologetic. That's what the client remembers. They don't remember the mistake later on. They just remember how easy you made it to fix it, how approachable you were. Um, if you are like, oh that wasn't me or I was in a rush and you put pressure on me and you moved the deadline or you changed the brief and you made any excuses like that, that's what they remember. They remember how unpleasant um, that particular confrontation was. So, I mean, hopefully it doesn't ha happen very often, but I think any mistake you make is an opportunity to be really brilliant about fixing it and ultimately come, come out of it with a stronger relationship as a result. How about you? What do you do when you've made a mistake? Have you, I mean, do you... Have you made any big mistakes that you can remember? I mean, definitely not, Beck. Sounds like flawless. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, of course. I mean, I wouldn't say, touch wood, I've made any huge howlers. But there have been instances where, um, you know, if you're writing a piece for the FT, they're going to come back with edits or they're going to say, actually, can you get a few more quotes out of this person? And I think when you're producing copy particularly, you can feel quite precious about the words that you've written um, and the research that you've put into it. But I will always completely agree with their professional opinion um, and do what they've asked me to do, because I would say that's also built into the fee that if they want to make some changes or they need some extra quotes um, or research, then I, I will definitely do that. Um, and usually it's ended up that the piece is better because of those edits and they're really thrilled and actually the last two pieces I've written for the FT have been on the front page of the supplement that I've written for so it's ended up being really you know everyone's ended up being happy with that um but yeah it can it can be hard to deal with any kind of negative feedback um particularly where you don't agree with what they're saying so I have had instances where they've 
wanted to change some of the sentences and it either hasn't quite made sense or it's actually just made it quite boring because you want people to be really sort of engaged with your article immediately and if they're trying to change the intro and make it more salesy for whatever reason um depending on what client you're working for it you know it just takes all the kind of zhuzh out of your piece um but again sometimes you just have to say well that's what they've paid for if that's what they're going to be happy with i'm going to let it go down to the ego again but that's it. And so in the newspaper world, we talk about it as killing your darlings. So often when you're writing a news piece and you've got a particular flourish or a turn of phrase, that it's a thing that you like the best about the thing that you've written. And that will invariably be the thing that the editor takes out. And you feel so emotionally invested in that thing. And I did it recently. I wrote a piece for um, a big wealth manager and it was all about how the super rich um, engage their family in like conversations about wealth planning. Like, do you tell your kids how much each of them are getting? And I started the piece with a quote from Notorious B.I.G. Like, mo money, more <laughs> problems. <laughs> I was like, this is genius. This is genius. I don't know whether genius. it made. I don't know whether it made it through the sign off process, but I could see. That was my darling on the page in the intro. And I was just telling myself, be prepared for that to be the first thing that gets cut and just, you know, be yeah. chill about it. Be, um, yeah. be gracious when it goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and have you had clients um, where their expectations are sky high and there's no sense of boundary? So they're emailing you in the middle of the night or texting you at weekends or setting impossible deadlines how do you deal with, deal with those kinds of clients it's interesting isn't it because i i can think of two instances in recent history where that's been the case and one client who does sometimes call me at seven o'clock and say i need you to do something urgently for me and i need to be able to put it out tomorrow morning but i love him he is such a nice man and he is the kind of person that will say it's seven o'clock i know you're in the middle of bedtime with your kids I need this done. I will pay you double. And so he, you know, the ebb and flow is, is there and I will always bend over backwards to do something for him. But then there was another another uh, potential client, no longer a client who wanted to wanted me to write a book for them and was just constantly sending me ideas and asking me to redraft things. I mean, we hadn't even got as far as like we'd, we'd had um, some ideas about how the chapters would go and I'd started writing a sample chapter one and it was just, it was just constant and frenzy, this communication. And it was exhausting and it was getting in the way of me actually writing the thing. And in the end, I had to pull out of the whole project and I had to say to the guy, um, I think honestly, you don't want me to write it. I think you want to write it, which is why you keep criticizing everything that I am putting together. I think ultimately this is your baby. You want to be the one that puts pen to paper and you want to feel like you're in control of the whole project. And that's why I think maybe you're blocking me from getting anywhere with it. And he said, you know, you're completely right. And that is how it is. And maybe I should go away and try and write it by myself. And then at least if I don't succeed, I can come back to you um, in a year or so. And then I'll know that there's no way I'm going to do it on my own. And then we can start again. I mean, I won't go back to the project, but at least, you know, we, we, we parted as friends. And did you say that in an email or did you say that face to face? No, I said it. I, I wasn't able to do it face to face, but I did it over the phone. And um, and I just I picked up the phone. I said. Mr. So-and-so, it's really great to catch you on the phone. I just wanted to um, clear the air a little on this project. Um, I've been seeing that you've made a lot of edits and um, there's some very specific things that he wanted. So he loved, do you know the oat milk brand, Oatly? Have you heard of it or seen it on shelves? Yes, I'm a fan. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you know the tone Have of voice? Have it in every, every cup of coffee. <laughs> well, the tone of voice they use on the packaging... Um, I think it's a bit marmitey. I hate it. There are people who love it, but it's like got on one side, it's got, oh, this is the boring side. Please do not read if you don't want to hear about our fabulous ingredients. I find the whole tone really patronizing and super serious. Anyway, he came back to me and said that he wanted the whole first chapter of this project rewritten in the Oatly tone. And at that point, I was like, oh, come on. So on this call, I said, you know, that this, this, and this, and this that you've asked for, it's getting to the point where, 
Um, I, it, it's just unmanageable, and I cannot produce the, the 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 the. I cannot do the job that you are asking of me. But I do think that maybe you would love to have a crack at it. And I was, you know, tried to be charming, tried to be persuasive in the way that I said. Um, it can be really hard to hand over your baby. This is your idea. And then you're trusting a complete stranger to try and bring your idea to life. I get that it's a hard process. Are you sure you don't want to have some time to put pen to paper? I'm not going to make you pay my fee. You know, we'll. I'm happy to give you the space and time to do this. And he, I think he was just so relieved that I just, the elephant in the room was now like visible to all. Um, but it had to be over the phone because if I tried to do it in an email, he would have probably got really cross, thought that I was, um, I don't know, just trying to start an argument. So yeah, it had to be done with charm and diplomacy. <laughs> and you can soften a conversation and put on that charm, oh, yeah, over the phone or via video um, in those face-to-face -face conversations. I do think it's much easier. Um, but yeah, I've had instances where the client is also getting in the way of me doing the project so I've had clients that you know want to have meetings sort of three times a week and those are really time consuming they're often not built into the fee that I'm charging because that wasn't agreed um particularly where I've been doing some work in America I'm then having to do it on you know US time as well um so that's that's been hard and I've had to say, you know, I'm happy to do these phone calls. Here are the times that I'm available. Um, and can we agree how many we're going to do a week? And then I can build that into the, the fee project going forward. So I've had to sort of call it out. Um, and a lot of the time if you, so it's often the client's client who are behaving in that way. So if you tell your contact, you know, actually I'm struggling, this isn't what's agreed hopefully they will be on your side and have your back. Um, so again, I think it's just about setting those boundaries of what you can and can't do and making sure if that does change, it's built into the fee structure. And remembering that these people were hard to work with when it comes to the next time they approach you with work. I mean, one of the joys of being a freelancer is that, you know, you might have to suck it up when you have a slightly tricky client, but you never have to work with them again. You can you know, you can see their name pop up in your emails and be like, uh, sorry, I'm too busy. <laughs> um, so what would you say, Bex, then, are your overall sort of rules for a successful confrontation? I think the first thing is to avoid them altogether by vetting your clients carefully, by being very clear about what is um, the, the parameters of the project, your fee, um, how far you're willing to go, um, whether you've got any like wiggle room in terms of like, do you have two projects overlapping? Can something take a bit longer or not? So that's kind of step one is to just try and mitigate any of those problems before they arise. The second thing is to try as much as you are able to do business with people that you like because it's so much easier to have those confrontations if there's mutual respect and you actually really want to reach a solution that works for both parties. So that that really helps. Um, the third thing I would say is don't run away from awkward conversations. Don't hide. Don't ghost someone just because you don't want to have that conversation. Um, face up to the problem and you'll often find that your anticipation of the conversation is so much worse than the actual conversation itself. Um, you'll build up in your mind, you'll be so worried it'll be a nightmare. And then nine times out of 10, you'll just explain the issue and they'll be like, oh, oh I didn't realize I was doing that. Oh, of course, this would be what you would think or whatever. And it's just resolved. So those are, I'd, I'd say those are my top three. Yours, your top three? I would say always go for the sandwich email, which is nice comment, negative comment nice comment oh and so nice sandwich it. it sandwich yeah um i i heard that from i think it was an hr director who obviously has to have a lot of um awkward conversations via email with <laughs> staff that they're firing etc um so yeah always try and sort of um bookend what you're saying with nice comments always be kind you know kindness is underrated um people will remember you for that. 
I would also say try not to let your emotions get in the way of a confrontation. So if you're really angry or really upset about something, don't send the email at that point. Sleep on it. Everything's always going to feel better in the morning. That's a really good point. Although I would say sometimes, sometimes it's a joy to just burn that bridge. You know, sometimes <laughs> when, when you've spent all week being really nice and like stuff and just being being like the rational party i had an instant recently instance recently where um a client that i hated working with and stopped working with then came back and asked me for something really unreasonable and i just let them have it and i have to say it <laughs> it felt fabulous and sometimes when i'm feeling a bit low i go back and read that email exchange and i just laugh about how good it felt to say no not doing it you were a nightmare not working with you again and just blah, just burnt that bridge to the ground <laughs> never going back so i occasionally occasionally just let the wrath out <laughs> yeah so to sum up if you've got a really hideous client get the match out <laughs> light it burn that bridge <laughs> burn that bridge to the ground Thank you so much for your time today, Bex. It's been such a pleasure chatting to you. And thank you so much for entrusting me with this podcast. I have loved hosting this season of Sound Advice Entrepreneurs Unfiltered. I hope everyone has enjoyed listening. Don't forget to rate, subscribe and share your favourite episodes. And it's goodbye from me and back to Bex. Okay, you've been so phenomenal. Um, but it is great to be back and I have to admit that while I was off I was jotting down names and some ideas for topics so my mind was still whirring and I've literally just brain dumped all of those ideas onto the sound advice team so um, for listeners I can tell you that we've got a really diverse and interesting mix of business types and sizes coming up all different kinds of experiences and perspectives for you so Whoever you are, whatever stage your business is at, there will be an episode this season that you can relate to. And that's my promise. So really looking forward to it. <laughs>